Well, hi, guys. Um, my name is Amber Conahan. I'm one of the writers for The Diz Insider, and it's so nice to see all of you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me today. I understand you guys have a very busy press day, so I'm just glad to be a part of it. Thank you, Amber. Yes, thanks for joining. Yeah, so um, I just finished season three. I have to say it was probably my favorite of the season so far. And I'm not going to get into spoiler territory, at least going to try not to get into spoiler territory. Um, but I do have a few questions that I wanted to ask you guys today. Um, so, Thomas, I'd like to start with you, if that's okay. Um, sure. So Terry seems to be the one on the show that gets kind of burnt by humans the most. He trusts them <laughs> so often and he ends up in all these terrible situations, but he keeps going back to them and he keeps wanting to do more stuff with humans. Um, why, why do you think this is? Isn't that all of us? Uh, <laughs> yeah, <it is. laughs> I think, I think he's just, he, he likes what humans do. He thinks he thinks like jet skis are cool and old TV shows are fun. And he just sinks his his teeth into, I guess not Americana but Humanicana, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and really just wants to be involved. And he's kind of down for anything. And also, I think it propels any any activity he's doing doubling down on humans means he doesn't have to take care of the pupa which is actually only one true job yes. Yes. and he'll he's willing to do anything but that so yeah so it's basically responsibility skirting that sounds about right and speaking about responsibilities and the pupa um mary it seems like this season your character jesse kind of takes more of a lead with the pupa and kind of gets a little bit more of an in a hands-on role with him would you like to Talk more about that and, and um, Jesse's relationship to the pupa. Um, I feel like I, I kind of feel like Jesse's the first to acknowledge that something's not right in our care of the pupa. <laughs> and that's what I really admire about Jesse. Um, and, and I think just overall as a whole, I was telling some other interviewers, this is that her, she's just, she's a little bit more assertive in, in her leadership in season three. So I kind of feel just this going with her overall character arc, wanting, getting more involved with, with the pupa. Right, yeah. And speaking of leadership, it definitely does seem like, I know Yumilak is Corvo's replicant, but if there were any natural successor to Corvo, it feels like it's more of Jesse than Yumilak. What do you have to say about that, Sean? <laughs> oh, I, you know, I, I would agree with that. I mean, Yumilak kind of gets distracted and he's, like, well, maybe that's kind of like how he's like, Terry, I guess he's like excitable in a way that's, but he's, he's just very more angry. And Yumi likes pretty angry. So yes. Um, yeah, that one may <laughs> probably make a good leader. And he, he I feel like Yumi like would probably, like he would be most likely to like abandon the rest of the team or something. So yeah, while Jesse is just like, she's definitely, she's probably the biggest heart of the, of the team. Um, well, in uh, competition with Terry Oh, So uh, yeah, I would agree with that probably. <laughs> yeah. And um, it definitely seems like in the past couple of seasons, Yummy Lack has been kind of like a bad influence devil on the shoulder for Jesse. And it's kind of getting her into some awkward and violent situations. But do you think that the reverse is true or that Jesse has had any in impact on how Yummy Lack is and how he interacts with humans? Well, Sean's a bad influence on me in real life. So he just it's kind a bit of, of a falls, terror. yeah, he, he's always telling Thomas and me to do things we shouldn't like, oh yeah, stand in front of that train, you know, yeah. Jaywalk. Like, do, Jaywalk. do these drugs, unsanctioned drugs. Yeah. It's, you don't really need to pay that parking ticket, my dude. Like all that kind of stuff. Acting. Weird. Not even acting. I, I yeah. did influence him a little bit at the end of season two, I think. Um, but but um, I'm having a hard time remembering season three influences over Sean. Sean, do you remember? Well, I, just an overall, like, it definitely seems like she's wearing on Yum Yulak and or rubbing off on Yum Yulak or something like that. Because <laughs> <laughs> he, he Yum Yulak's kind of more empathetic than he's ever been. And he, yeah, he's kind of like grinching out and kind of like finding his heart in some ways. So mm -hmm. that has to be through the work of Jesse. Thank you, Sean, for acknowledging it finally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, and then Mary, you just said something about like, not really, you know, not even acting at some points that, um, that kind of springs on my next question. How much improvisation do you guys get to do um, on this show versus how much is it, you know, strict what the writers are asking for? Good, a good amount, right? Right. Tom, yeah. Thomas loves it. I love it. Sean's trying to, trying to rein us back in, but but w they're so free, aren't they? It's like such a joy to work with these directors and producers. They're, they're just let us do what we want to do as long as we give them a few as written. Yeah, as long as you give, as, and as long as your riffs don't totally derail the plot or anything like that. Like, I think it's like, it's tricky to go in with the, with the impetus to like add too much. Like you're really kind of looking for seasoning on the steak as opposed mm -hmm. to cooking a new steak. Because the scripts are so funny, like you don't really need to be like, "Oh, trust me, I've got, I've got better." Dudes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, what's, it's kind of like um, improv or like little moments here and there, little riffs here and there, lend itself to the medium of animation so well because you're just like in a booth and you're saying the lines, saying in different ways, and then like adding some new stuff. And if it's funny and if it fits they just animate to it. They just like put that in the audio track and make that part of the thing. And they don't have to like mm -hmm. um, talk to production to build a new set or to make a new costume or something. You mm -hmm. just, they just animate it. So it's pretty cool, pretty fun. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So then are you guys all in the booth together or do you record your lines separately? I refuse to be in the booth with these people. Mm -hmm. yep. Of course. Yep. We <laughs> no. <laughs> <I> just... <laughs> We've done, we pretty much do it separate. I think at one point these guys were together for a hot minute, but mm -hmm. it's been it's been separate, which is pretty mm -hmm. standard, I feel like nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, and, and um, Thomas said earlier that y you have a great point, Thomas, when you said nobody wants to hear you improvising on, ah, 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. for, for too long, you know, <laughs> it's just like, just get your own stuff done and you don't have to sit through everybody else's stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Mary, I have a question for you. So Jessie is the heart of this show. She cares so much for the humans. She wants to belong <laughs> with them, wants to interact with them. So why do you feel that she goes along with the wall? You know, she leaves them, you know, candy and stuff when they go out, but why doesn't she want them to be free and rather living their lives? I know this is the conflict of Jessie, but I think she seriously thinks she's like doing them uh, she's being loving when she like throws in some Reese's pieces or whatever she feels like she's doing the right thing there and she doesn't realize that it was just totally wrong in the first place to put them in the wall uh it's it's good writing that way you know I um why yeah. does she go along with the wall well Yemulek started it and we know how that happens uh, we know what happens when when he has a thing it just it gets out of control yeah kind of goes on to her and she'll just kind of go along with it because she looks up to her big brother kind of thing yeah yeah but but really she thinks she's being a good person even though <laughs> she's, she's kind of killing all these humans and taking them away from their families yeah that's well, kind of <laughs> it's just one of the downsides to the wall yeah. <laughs> um thomas i have a question for you um how would you say that terry and corvo's relationship has evolved and kind of grown specifically with this season it, uh, Terry and Corvo's relationship has definitely gotten a lot more intimate, a lot more romantic. They're expressing their affections towards one another as Schlorpians do, uh, male or female or whatever they're perceived gender to be. Um, I think it's pretty, it's, it's funny and also kind of like refreshing that it's undefined and fluid <laughs> yes like if if two co-workers say good job and express it like, <laughs> but with a very intimate moment I suppose that's what those the, that Terry and Corvo do which I think is is fun they, they are also you know realizing what their family unit part is I feel like Terry's kind of like this de facto mother and Corvo is like a stern angry taskmaster father yeah. And occasionally they make time for their love. You know what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so speaking of families and sitcoms, this show, while being a sci-fi comedy, is also very much like the traditional sitcoms of the past. 
what shows do you think might have influenced like this season in particular? If you're looking back, like Seinfeld or something like that. Ooh. What shows? That's good. Uh, I honestly think because there's so many moments, like you'll have a you'll have a an episode that's filled with like constant insanity you know 20 people die or you know like a bunch of references that are little claws out or something and it's just like wow that was that was 22 minutes of 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 a lot and then it'll end in a like group hug and everyone's sweet to each other and saying i love you it kind of feels like um full house on acid or something like that (laughs) so to me it feels like this season in particular has got a dash of 90s sitcom 90s family sitcom yeah, that definitely, that definitely shows through, I'd have to say. Mm-hmm. And then, so there are so many different like sci-fi gadgets in the show. There's so much that, especially um, your character uses, Sean. Do you have a favorite that you can remember from the season or even seasons past? Um, oh, you know, I, I thought I was about to say a spoiler or something, but um, I'm trying to. Well, the self-defense jacket that was going nuts and attacking everybody, then, um, well, Aisha is probably my, the coolest, like, sci-fi thing, I think, just, like, in that room that she has that can simulate anything, and, um, yeah, the one that keeps sticking, sticking in my mind is, I think, was from my last record, and I don't know if that's, even, that's season three or not, so I'm, I'm the... <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. oh saying, no but it's like filling up my head and i can't say it <laughs> what what about that ray gun in season two sean where you i love that ray gun where you made wine where you got those gargoyles to oh them. that thing was awesome the dogs yeah yeah like they they ate a human and then they made that human into wine and crapped out that oh my gosh why there's a lot of great ones that choose from <laughs> <That's laughs> ridiculous yeah. <laughs> that's my favorite one <laughs> thomas do you have a standout of the of the invention race yeah mm-hmm. wasn't what was the mm, i'm there everything's bleeding into each other no i don't have i don't have one that's yeah. coming in <laughs> just yet no sorry all good. All good. So, um, Sean and Mary, you guys were talking a little bit about the future. You know, you don't know if something was season four or whatever, yeah. kind of like that. Um, what are you guys hoping for and looking forward to with your characters going forward? What kind of growth or something would you like to see from them? Sean, what do you want? Um, you know, Thomas said something that's like pretty, I, I like what he had said. It was like, where what they write like is just kind of like you're kind of just like strapping in and being like okay I'll go wherever they're they're writing because the writing is just kind of so fun and Mm -hmm. they'll bring it to an area that um maybe I had I'd never thought of before so um I kind of just sit back and just wait to see what they come up with but maybe like what if he actually I don't know if they'd ever graduate from school but I don't know if that's Looking forward to them not being considered children anymore. Yeah, but that's kind of a part of it. So, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm just so on board with it. Whatever they write, I, like, because it always catches me by surprise. Really, I think Jesse's after stability. Like everything she's been doing, it seems to be like leading them toward a more traditional life. Like they, they love it when they go back on vacation to this the a yearly vacation to the same place you know and just in school with her organization I feel like that's what she's after like she's after a stable human life in the end that's part of are we all yeah (laughs) (laughs) we are sister yes yeah Thomas you got do you do you what is your answer for Terry like What's yeah, what, I kind of want to see. see I want to see Terry like have a full come apart. Like he's he. he <laughs> yeah. I like him. I like him when he's like very distressed. You know, addicted to meth and and white wine and yeah. Oh yeah, just completely off the rails. 
and um, Corvo needs to rescue him in some mm-hmm. way, and it's like a really romantic sort of yeah. cover of a <laughs> of a novel. That would be perfect. Yeah, if, if we can sort of map it to like a Last of the Mohicans story, that would be, that would be pretty sweet. Yes, 10 out of 10 would watch. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Hello. Thank you guys so much for your time and having me. It was a pleasure speaking with all of you. And I'm so excited for um, season three to come out and for season four, whenever that is. Yay, yay. Yeah. Thank you, Us Amber. Too. Thank so you. Much, Amber. Can I show you the hat that I wear on our legal calls? Go for it. Boom, baby. Yes. Oh. Like, you don't have to wear that every time. Josh, tell her, how often do I wear this hat during legal calls? Almost 100%. <laughs> I still have mine buried somewhere in my closet from my, from my time working at Disneyland. This is my son's. Did you work? What did you do at Disneyland? Oh, I worked attractions. I worked at um, Luigi's and Disney Junior, a.k.a. the Baby oh, Rave. Oh, <laughs> no way. That's so yeah. funny. Yeah, but this is not about me. This is about you guys and the no, I'm amazing sorry, I just show. I have one question, what though. Okay, okay. I, I do have one question. When you say attractions, that means you don't say, people don't say, oh, I worked rides. They're called attractions. That is correct. So, yes. like, if you if you are the person who runs... Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, you say, oh, I work attractions. Well, listen, Luigi's yes. Dancing Cars is a little bit more high tech, all right, than Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. No, I know, I, but I, 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 I caught that. Okay, so it's attractions. Okay, really interesting. Yes. Okay, yeah. so it's not a ride. It's coordinated robotic cars, Josh. Get Exactly. Over. You got to get with the program. <laughs> Son who plays the pupa loves the Luigi Ride. We go on it every time we're there. It's the best. Um, well, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me. I'm so I'm super excited to talk to you guys. Uh, I finished oh, season three last night, and I have to oh, say, nice. it was amazing and probably my my favorite of the season so far. I am thank completely you. enthralled. So, congratulations on that. We love to hear it. You're our first audience. It's not even out in the world yet. That makes us so happy. So, um, there's you you mentioned the pupa just now. So there, that's one thing I wanted to ask about. Um, the pupa is probably the most fascinating and uh, multifaceted character on the show. How do you toe the line between portraying him as a toddler and a master of the long con? I think that like you a all great kind of feel you. I mean, first off, Josh has kids too. All children are masters of the long con. Yes, it's, great. <laughs> uh, it's not like when I first. When Sagan was first born, we, we were developing the show. And I remember saying to Justin, I knew that I would love him, but I didn't know I would be afraid of him. Cause you're just always afraid that they're gonna get hurt or like they're yes. gonna break something or whatever. And for some reason, kids walk into the room and they're always holding something. You don't want like, like, ah, oh, butter knife. <laughs> Why did you even get that? You know, and like yeah. the pupa was really that combination of it scares you, but you love it. Like it's the most important thing, but you also don't know how to deal with it. And it's kind of unknowable, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so, you know, that, that has like a sci-fi element. It has a family element. It's such a cute little Hershey's kiss of a character that like, he really is kind of like the iconic totem of the show. He's like a, the pupa is like a perfect balance of the sci-fi and the, the, the humanity of the show at the same time in the heart. Yes. Um, I think that the the more we make you feel like he's a little kid, the more we can rug pull and surprise you when he's tricking an adult into giving him candy in a long con. Yeah. And, uh, or becoming a teenager. Yes, that was an interesting development this season that I was not expecting. <laughs> yeah, well, now my son is talking a lot more. So I was like, we should do an episode about this. It's freaking me out. You know? Yes, I, it, it did me too. And <laughs> all the characters. <laughs> Um, it definitely seems like personal growth and change is one of the main themes of the season. So what made you guys decide that it was time for Corvo to stop, you know, trying to fix the ship and leave and kind of settle into life on Earth, even though Earth won't exist anymore, should the pupa fulfill his job? You know, I think after, after, because we just wrote season four, right? So season three, we came into it and we were like, look, what have we learned about these characters over two seasons? And it's, it's that Corvo and Terry might not see eye to eye on how to do things, but they often see eye to eye on what they want, right? And Corvo had spent two seasons claiming that he only cared about the mission and the ship, but then feeling left out and having emotions that he was claiming that he didn't have. And finally, in season three, 
we just wanted to make it clear that he loves Terry. He wants to have a family. He loves his family that he kept saying, I love the mission, but that mm-hmm. was his way in his way of like, that he wasn't good at expressing himself, but that he, he does love and want to have this relationship with his, with his partner and these kids, you know, and these replicants. Mm-hmm. So we came into season three being like, how can we make the solar opposites more of a family than a team by the end of this season? And every solar episode kind of came from that conversation. That's beautiful. And I think it definitely comes across. They seem more family-like than ever with all the bickering, awesome. but also all, all the love and all the feels. And it's, it's amazing. That's awesome. I'm really glad to hear you say that. So the other, you know, huge part of your show is The Wall, everybody's favorite, you know, big <laughs> drama, all the craziness. Um, what can we expect from The Wall this season and going forward? And um, so far, the Solar Opposites and The Wall story have been very separate. Do you, yep. do you foresee any clash in the future? There's, there will be a day where the wall story ends and it joins up with the solars. That day is not this season. That day is not season four. We have minimum three more seasons worth of storytelling that we need to do in the wall. Um, when, when Justin and I first pitched the show to Hulu, the wall was going to be just the first season. And then we loved doing it so much. And then every season was going to be a different sci-fi thing that kind of grew and took over the show a little bit, like how Mm -hmm. The Wall did season one. But we loved writing the world of The Wall. We we didn't expect how much world building and how great the artists were going to be and how much fun it would be to work with Alfred Molina and Christina Hendricks and Andy Daly and everybody. And like, you know, Sterling K. Brown who comes into it. And it's it's one of those things where like, when you love doing something, you want to let it grow. You don't want to just go with your original plan, you know? And so season three of The Wall, what you can look forward to is that some storylines end and other storylines begin. Some things are resolved and other things are germinating and growing that have been there the whole time, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, between you and me, and you don't necessarily have to put this in there because it's very spoilery, but like, we've been growing the religious theocracy of the power of the church (sighs) in The Wall for three seasons. Yeah. you're yes. happening at a time that's ringing very unsettling mm-hmm. like in our regular lives too and yes. season four leans on that story very heavily you know and so yeah. we cast Sutton Foster as the nun that 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 causes it all to happen as Sister Sisto and Sutton is an amazing actor who never gets to play like the villain you know what I mean like she's yes like, always- then that I mean, I could see the like the sprinklings going through the season and, you know, you guys had this amazing idea in your head, but I didn't know how that was all going to turn out. And I have to say, after the last scene with the wall, and I had to I had to turn it off for a second. I was like, wow, this I did fun. not. I didn't know you guys were, could go that far. You know, oh, even yeah. even I knew it was going to be fucked up. Sorry, go ahead, Josh. No, I was just going to say season four it really where that all of that plays out but that's been a plan for a while since we introduced the the church basically i knew i knew that musically because we had that moment with the mouse first season which we intentionally oh, wanted to destroy people with because you succeeded thank you very much sorry <laughs> well we wanted the wall to feel like it had stakes you know what i mean mm-hmm. like it's, and like it was the saddest thing i could imagine doing and then i was like actually at the end of this season human beings can't hear a screaming baby and not feel like they need to help and I was like that's gonna help us so that 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 foley of the baby screaming when she's being branded at the end of the season of little Pesley Mm -hmm. is like you can't not freak out at it you know no (laughs) oh yeah no that was that was much darker place than I thought the wall was gonna go so that was really exciting but terrifying Yes. To see. Okay, good. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, shifting tone a little bit, you know, we've been talking about the sci-fi aspects. And so you guys obviously have um a plan for future seasons. What um what kind of sci-fi rays gadgets have you created that you maybe haven't found a use for, but that's something that you might want to incorporate later? And what's been your favorite that you've gotten to use so far? I mean, we know season four, so that kind of yeah. my answer would be like there's a there's a thing in season four that's my favorite episode we've done from a ray we created that's so stupid. Stupid, but also <laughs> like it's stupid, but it's also like so no duh. It's a thing yeah. that we have a ray in the show that you've seen in a million other sci-fi things, but 
but we use it in a way that's so ludicrous that an entire episode is spent in the most ridiculous way. Like, like you know the lion episode this season? Where it's oh, like, I love that one. Oh my gosh. That we was beautiful. That. And we, we keep challenging ourselves to be like, how can we change what, what an episode can do? Mm-hmm. And there's an episode with a Ray we created that's so stupid and so funny. And it changes how the show has to be for an episode. Mm-hmm. And it, we just saw the animatic of it. And we're like, this is one of the best episodes we've ever done. It's so stupid. I, and I know that's not helpful for you to print. I'd say like, if uh, I, I think the shrink ray is still really exciting because I love what can go in the wall you know, and mm-hmm. uh, we just have a bunch. Of, I mean, like even down to like a gargoyle ray. It just was gargoyle funny. Yes, ray. that one. That one that was, was they great. have a gargoyle ray. It's so stupid. Mm-hmm. Why would they have a gargoyle ray? You and know, so then a mix how... of high concept, like smart person sci fi mm-hmm. and then the stupidest thing possible mixed together. You know what yeah. I mean? So then how do you guys determine what, you know, you can just kind of sci-fi away and what problems need to be actually talked out and and fixed more in a human solution rather than a Schlorpian one? I think if it feels unearned, it has to be a human solution. Like you have to like, you can't sci-fi array away somebody's feelings, but mm-hmm. you can sci-fi array a problem they don't give a shit about. You know what I mean? Yes. Like if Terry is upset at Corvo, you can't solve that with a ray. Mm-hmm. If the red goobler's wife is threatening to stab you, you can turn her into a rat. Like, it's like, I think as long as it directly reflects under the emotional status of our characters, you can't just hand wave it away. But the the ship having an infinite amount of rays in it for comedy is so mm-hmm. useful for us yes. because it means that we can tell any story we want and you could believe it could happen on Solar Opposites. Yes. No, that... I, I totally get it. Thank you so much for, for your time today. It was so amazing talking to you guys. Sure. And I am looking forward to season three being out in the world and everyone getting to see the amazingness that I just saw. And mm-hmm. I am looking forward to season four. It sounds like you guys already have it, you know, pretty much signed, sealed, delivered. And now yeah, we just yeah. got to wait. <laughs> yeah, we're animating it now. We love season three. We love season four. And like, the way we write it is we're writing four seasons ahead with the with the wall with the silver cops with like oh that was a, that was a crazy development i especially when you guys just dropped it in that one episode and i was like oh this is cool and i was like yep. wait a second now wait there's more stakes so so silver cops in season 4 is about as big as the wall is like we're having wow but the wall is all over season 4 as well and we have I want to go back to the wooden city. We love world building in Solar mm-hmm. Opposites and we love continuing stories more than any logic would say we should. And if you like this season, I think you're going to love season four. Then I am so completely excited and I, I know I'm going to love it. <laughs> so thank you so much for creating something so wonderful and amazing that, you know, it's so easy to get lost in. Well, thank you. Thank you, Amber. For being our first audience to tell us that they liked it and and we can't wait for it to drop too. Like, this is so exciting for us. Thank you, Amber. You're very welcome. You guys have a great day. Thanks, Amber. Bye. Bye.